Franklin, why don't you open the door on the other side? Plymouth or Dodge dealership. They'll fix it fast without changing all your locks. Do it now. Yes, your new Mopar lock cylinder service and repair kit has everything needed to fix individual ignition, door, and tailgate lock cylinders, thus maintaining the single key feature. No longer is it necessary to replace a complete matched set of locks when only one goes sour. Now, let's look inside one of them. To begin with, all Chrysler Corporation car and truck locks employ a rotating cylinder inside a lock body. Only the correct key will turn this cylinder. Inside, you'll find small coil springs, drivers, and tumblers. The drivers and tumblers ride up and down in five drilled holes. Here, in an oversized model of a typical lock cylinder, you can see how the drivers and tumblers are positioned when assembled. Tumblers are cone-shaped at one end and have a flat surface at the other. Drivers have a flat surface that butts against the flat face of the tumbler and a small shoulder at the other end which centers the coil springs. When the correct key is inserted, all tumblers and drivers align with the parting line and the lock cylinder can be turned easily, unlocking the lock. On the other hand, if the wrong key is inserted, the tumblers and drivers are forced into different positions, but they do not align with the parting line. As a result, the lock cylinder cannot be rotated and it remains locked. Now, you've no doubt noticed that the drivers and tumblers come in different lengths. This difference is what makes it possible to have thousands of different key combinations using only five tumblers and drivers. Yet, there are six different sizes of tumblers available, as well as six different sizes of drivers. Remember though, only five are used in any one lock cylinder. In your kit, you'll find six compartments, each containing 50 tumblers and 50 drivers. Although no numbers are stamped on the metal surfaces, the largest size driver is a number one, while the smallest is a number six. On the other hand, a number six tumbler is the largest, while a number one is the smallest. Remember too, a number one driver is always used in combination with a number one tumbler. A number two driver is always matched to a number two tumbler, and so forth for all of the others. Now you're probably wondering how to determine driver and tumbler sizes, since they're not marked. Right, it's easy. Take the code plate and use it as a decoder. Here's what to do. Take the tweezers that come with the kit and grasp a tumbler. Place it between the upper and lower edges of the tapered slot and slide it along the lower edge until the cone-shaped end touches the top edge. Here, using an oversized code plate, you can see how the tumbler size is indicated when it stops at the numbered mark appearing below the tapered slot. Drivers are also decoded in the same manner. Their size is indicated by the numbers appearing above the tapered slot. One other thing to keep in mind, drivers and tumblers are always used together in matched pairs, and the overall length of each set is identical. But notice that the separation line between each of the combinations varies. Only a key with a correct set of cuts will align these separations. In other words, the depth of the key cut tells us what the size of the driver and tumbler must be. The shallowest key cut is a number one, while a number five cut is much deeper. A number six cut is the deepest of all. But how can we tell what the depth of the key cuts are? Easy. 
Once again, use the key code plate and decode the cut nearest to the key shoulder, first by sliding it along the tapered slot. As the key slides along the tapered slot, it will stop at a numbered mark. This is a number two cut, as indicated by the key numbers listed below the lower edge of the slot. Decode the second key cut from the shoulder. This is a number three cut. Repeat this until all of the remaining cuts have been decoded. You'll end up having five key cut numbers. It is these numbers that tell you what tumbler driver combinations are needed. In other words, a number one key cut tells you that you need a number one tumbler and a number one driver, and so forth for all the other key cuts. Therefore, a number two driver and tumbler are needed here, a number three matched pair here, a number one matched pair here, and so on. Next, install the coil springs. If there's any doubt about their condition, install new coil springs to make sure the lock will work properly. Temporarily cover the springs in the drilled holes, then try the key in the lock. Then place the tumbler cover in position and stake it securely by punching the metal ridge at four points. Now, let's assume someone like Franklin comes in with a bad door lock cylinder. He has a key, even though it is bent out of shape. Here's what has to be done. After removing the bad lock cylinder from the door, remove the E-clip and lever and discard the lock. Decode the key cuts as shown before and record them on a slip of paper. Now, build up a new replacement lock cylinder. But if both keys are missing and you do not know the lock or key code, pull the opposite door lock cylinder to get the code. Obviously, it's easier to do this than removing the one from the ignition switch. Now, pop the tumbler cover off. Remove the five coil springs. Then cover all the holes except the one nearest the key insertion end. Turn the lock cylinder over and drop the tumbler and driver out. Uncover the next drilled hole and drop this matched pair out. Continue until all are removed and placed in the correct order. Decode the tumblers or the drivers as demonstrated before. It is not necessary to decode both. Reinstall the tumblers, drivers, and springs in their original positions. After new keys are cut, make sure the lock operates easily. Next, snap on a new tumbler cover. Build up the new replacement lock cylinder using the same tumbler and driver code. Now, you're probably wondering what to do if the ignition lock is damaged or broken and won't operate, yet you have the correct key. To remove it, first disconnect the battery ground cable. Remove the steering wheel center pad and the retaining nut. Using the special puller, remove the steering wheel. Never bump or hammer downward on the tool or the steering shaft, or you may break the shear pins that are part of the telescoping safety feature. Remove the turn signal lever and upper bearing plate retainer screws. The ignition key lamp assembly is next. Remove the three lock housing to bearing housing screws and the upper bearing snap ring. With the bearing housing removed, pry the sleeve off the lock plate hub. Carefully tap out the lock plate pin. The lower snap ring and the lock plate are next. Remove the lock lever guide plate and the buzzer switch. With the key removed, Push down on the spring-loaded lock retainer. While doing so, slide the ignition lock out of the housing and discard it. Build up a new ignition lock cylinder with tumblers and drivers of the same code and in the same order as you've established. That is, through decoding the key, or if you have no key, decoding one of the other lock cylinders in the matched set. After installing the springs, operate the lock cylinder to make sure your coding is correct. If OK, then stake the tumbler cover in place by punching the metal at four points. Hold the spring-loaded retainer down, then insert the cylinder into the housing. Slide it in until the retainer snaps into the hole in the casting. 
Again, try the lock in all positions, making sure it operates properly. After all the parts have been installed, test operation of horns, lights, ignition switch, and turn signals. Nothing to it, right? And customers like Franklin who come to you with lock problems can get back on the road in a hurry so they can get to work or return home. Franklin, let's not start that again. Are you using the back door key?